Well, welcome again, everyone. We're going to cover chapter seven this week of our review of Rod Dreher's book, The Benedict Option. And uh, as we get started, as has now become our tradition, I'm going to ask Marty to start us in prayer, please. Absolutely. Father in heaven, thank you again that you are um, our God, that you have made us, that you have redeemed us with the blood of your own son so that we might be your people, that we might function together um, among one another, that we might serve as your people. And Lord, we thank you for opportunities like this to discuss how you would have us to do that. Lord, um, guide us that we would speak with wisdom and with grace um, to the glory of your name, to the encouragement and building up of your people through Christ. Amen. Amen. So Marty uh, missed the, the memo on the light blue shirt this week. So maybe we're going to have to when, send that to Selene, maybe? When the cool fronts come, then I go to the darker fall things. I see. He's one of those. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm so dialed into fashion. Yeah. Okay. Admit it, Selene put your clothes out for you, right? <clears throat> she doesn't put them out, but after I got married, things started disappearing from my closet <laughs> and being replaced with things that were more fashionable. Were, so, they, were they orange and purple? N- no, <laughs> no, they were not that. So, um, so th- th- that's, uh, and I, I, I noticed that with a, another friend of mine that got married about the time that I did. He's like, you know, some of your clothes are just disappearing. <laughs> and uh, now I, you know, so, so she dresses me in the sense of she directs my options, mm-hmm. but she's doing it from like way further upstream. Okay. <laughs> so it's passive aggressive. Clothing and design <laughs> options. She would say it's just helping me be the best me I can be. <laughs> good okay. response. That yeah. is safe. Yeah. You can good. go home after this. And then you say thank you, dear. I, right? do. Yeah. I do. Yeah, that's good. Um, all right, so we'll get started here with question number one. So this week we are, are going to be covering the, um, the topic of education as Christian foundation. And so um, this one will be interesting because we do have a a variety of viewpoints, I'm sure, within our our own congregation Mm -hmm. on this question. And so um, really a lot of what we're talking about in in this particular chapter, and maybe you could say that for a lot of these chapters, is they're wisdom issues. And by that, we mean there's not always a clear this is right and this is wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, By that, we mean... You know, we have to dig a little bit deeper um, and and prayerfully consider things and consider the wisdom of those who have gone before us and that sort of thing to, to figure out the answers to these. And some of what that means is there can be different answers for different people in different mm-hmm. situations. So, um, so it'll be interesting to see how we tease that out here this week. The question one says, every educational model presupposes an anthropology, an idea of what a human being is. Ideally, what kind of people does the educational model at your child's school form? So we've got the Christian headmaster. Is that a, is headmaster your official, head of, official title? Head of school. Head of school, okay. So, um, not that we have to tease that out. We've got the, yeah, we've got the head of school here who... Um, well, I think that's a that's a great statement that it gets lost in the idea of education because that is a reference to um, I couch it in the following way when I talk to parents, you know, I tell them, you know, your the responsibility for the education of your children falls upon you according to scripture. But I would say one of the most important questions you need to ask your said school is what worldview are you going to impart or plant on my children because everybody and every school teaches from a worldview, and they teach from the perspective that it's right and true. So that's what your children understand. That's what he's referencing here with the idea of anthropology and the idea of what a human being is. Um, you know, my kids are grown. My daughter's at college. So um, for our family, because I've been in education, they've all been in Christian schools. So the the Christian mindset, the Christian worldview has been that which they've encountered Um we homeschooled for a period of time. Same thing. They encountered that Christian mindset. For our perspective, we approach it from a classical standpoint, which he's going to talk about, which we're going to talk about today. So, um, But I do think that statement right there is an important statement for everybody when they're considering the education for their children. Okay. 
I, I heard a, a Jewish thinker recently, but um, thought he said something really interesting. He, he's Jewish. He's devoutly Jewish. He's, um, he has a um, affinity for Christians, though, where he sees Christians as allies in a lot of things, which makes sense. And, and he said this. He said the difference between a secular education and a religious education, if it's a, if it's a um, Jewish, a strongly Jewish or Christian education, he said the difference is this: in a, in a religious education, you learn that the biggest problem you have in life is you. And in a secular education, the biggest problem is something else out there, um, society, other people. And I thought that was very insightful. So uh, the uh, my kids have been educated really all the above, some private Christian schooling, some homeschooling, very little of that, and then mostly public ed. And certainly public ed by and large, does not have a biblical anthropology. But I would say the sad thing is to understand that we're sinners and that our biggest problem is us, not the society out there uh, or not not somebody else. So, um, you know, our kids certainly didn't get that educationally, but in a lot of Christian con- a lot of Christian schools and churches, honestly, that message has fallen by the wayside, that our biggest problem is sin. Mm-hmm. So... Um, yeah, I think definitely the, the the anthropology, the view of themselves that would have been promoted by my kid's school mm-hmm. would have been the standard cultural anthropology that you're okay, you just need opportunities, and most of the really bad things are somebody else's fault. Yeah. That probably would have been the case. But but let, I, I wanted, can I, can I read a passage, and then I wanted to kind of, because I think this is a springboard for a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so... Um, but I think as we go through all these things, I'm going to come back repeatedly to, I think the answer ultimately is the church. Um, I really love the church. I'm a huge fan of the church. Uh, I think the church is... that a surprise? <laughs> yeah. It's a headline in the, in the paper tomorrow. And honestly, <laughs> I think for spiritual the formation, the, the church is where it's at. And the, the Christian family plugged into a strong church is ultimately the foundation and then educational things, where we live, you know, things like that are going to be wisdom issues and resource issues. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you look at, or if I re- let me read a, uh, Hebrews ten, it's a familiar passage, but beginning in verse nineteen. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He inaugurated for us through the veil, that is His flesh. And since we have a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The reason I read that, especially in not forsaking our assembling together as is the habit of some, I would say what, whatever we're doing educationally, we need, I'm going to call it a robust participation in a healthy Christian church body where our souls are going to be fed from the Word of God, where we're going to worship God together with His people, where we're going to be nourished by the ordinary means of grace. And I know we're going to come to this later, but I think that is by God's grace. Our kids were publicly educated, but they were in a church body where I hope the preaching was biblically sound. Um, and because they grew up under, under uh, my pastoral ministry, but, they, but where, they were, where they were pointing to Christ, they understood from a very young age, this is a fallen world. People are going to sin against you. You're going to sin yourself, but your biggest mm-hmm. problem is your sin. And and what you need to do is look to Christ, turn from sin to Christ, look to Christ, and by God's grace, walk with Him. And so then the way that they navigated things going on 
they were privately, classically, Christianly educated for mm-hmm. a while. There were things, but you know, they're, they're sin everywhere. So things they had to navigate there, both in themselves and outside themselves. I, I think that they always were being pointed back to, but you got to walk with Christ. Doesn't matter if you're being homeschooled, if you're being privately schooled, if you're being publicly schooled. But they were getting that at church constantly. They were getting a pretty robust biblical education. The way our Sunday school works here, the kids get a lot of Bible Mm -hmm. content, especially early on. And then they were getting a lot of categories of thinking uh, with the catechism and uh, and then being helped to see as they got older how that all fleshed out. So uh, that's taken us a a little bit on a a tangent, but, but I think that's part of what prepared them to be functioning Christian young adults. So this is my plug at the beginning. We're about to go on to education, but 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 I want to really encourage us and encourage people that uh, that I think a robust participation in a healthy church body and a family that's that's availing itself of those means of grace is going to be huge. Whatever is going to be indispensable and foundational and actually more important than whether you homeschool, privately school, or or publicly school. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting on the anthropology question. You talked about the problems either is with me or it's with everything else. Um, it's reminded of a, a silly old Monty Python skit where <laughs> somebody does, I don't remember what this guy does, but uh, the people around him call in the police or they actually call in the church police. So it's like these, these guys with bishops hats, but also all, all these Anglicans yeah. that show up. Right. And um, they you know, run this investigation and they interrogate this guy. And eventually he said, I don't remember what he did, but he says in the end, Okay, I admit I did it, but society is to blame. <laughs> and so the church police said, okay, well, we'll just take all them in then. And they took everyone else on the stage but the guy who did it, you know, <laughs> off to jail. And, uh, but, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of pretty insightful. Yeah, you know, uh, this was yeah. back in the 70s, but, but that's kind of, uh, you know, where, where we've landed in a lot of ways. But, but that, it's easy to do, right? The problem is out there. The problem is everywhere but inside of me. And, um, you know, I remember when I studied – philosophy in college, uh, particularly when I took an epistemology class, just the study of knowledge. My professor really hammered home this point uh, for philosophy in general, where he said, where you start largely determines where you end. So, for example, in in the question of epistemology, if you ask the question, how do I know what I know? That question is going to lead you down a, a certain path. If you start with the question, do I know anything? That initial question is going to start you down a very different path that's going to lead you to a very different conclusion. And so where you start in your in your questioning and your modeling and whatever else it is really has a huge effect on where we land. So, yeah, if you start with the notion that the problem is with me um, and that man is inherently sinful, that's going to take you a very different place than the notion that we're all basically good. Mm-hmm. And when you look at you know the popular education model that's out there right now, that's that's where they land, right? That that right. that we're all basically good. Um, all right, so we'll jump to our next question here. From a Christian point of view, why is it not enough for schools to fill the heads of their students with knowledge? What role does the heart play? Well, it's because there, there's a great old line <laughs> from a Puritan. To educate the unconverted mind is only to increase its capacity for evil. And um, so just information by itself doesn't produce faithfulness. You know, it's not wisdom. And, and as Christian parents, we ought to definitely be concerned not just with the head of our kids and the one-day income of our kids, but the heart of our kids. And then I think if you don't address the heart— you really are not able to tie things together. A lot of disciplines even go off on tangents that start to miss the issue because they're never addressing the heart and the fact that the human heart is fallen. My daughter, Eliza, came in months ago and she was taking psychology as an elective, you know, at school, AP psychology. And she came in and she said, Dad, I've pretty much decided psychology is an attempt to explain why people do what they do without any reference to sin. And, that's pretty good. Wow. And, yeah. and that's, um, yeah, I mean, it's insightful. So you, you got to address the heart um, or you're just, 
learning facts, but then you can't even make sense of why the facts are that you might observe certain things, but you never really, you don't, you don't have any way of saying, well, this is why that is. Or, or if we have a biblical worldview, then a lot of the things that we learn, even from secularists, a lot of the things that we learn, the information we're able to go, well, yeah, that makes sense. You know, not so when, when we hear somebody say that the, the outcome for kids from broken homes is not as good as from intact homes, then we as Christians would say, well, of course, because and, and it's not every everybody who might be watching this if, if they're in a broken home that may not be their fault they may not have wanted the home to break up but the point is God made us the general pattern ought to be um, you know husband and wife laboring together faithfully to rear their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord mm-hmm. so shouldn't surprise us if people try to do something other than that and get a different outcome so I think if you don't have a Christian worldview and you address the heart you don't tie together why things happen. I agree. I mean, was it was it Lewis who said, if you're only putting content in your mind, you just become a wiser devil? Mm-hmm. You know, and the idea that, mm-hmm. um, you know, modern, I mean, in modern education, only recently in the grand scheme of education, have we talked about education strictly as a cognitive process. Prior to that, it was considered a whole body process. It was mind and body. It was trial and error. It was apprenticeships and discipleship. It was, you know, we are primarily an agrarian society where kids were schooled at home with mom and dad. And there was a worldview there. There was morality. There was skills. There was all these different things. Only when the Industrial Revolution came along and pushed us into this public venture of everybody being educated by the state, and the battle in Massachusetts was with parents for years where parents were um, pushed back on the state and then eventually acquiesced and gave the state the, uh, the power, did we start to consider education from a different perspective? You know, and if you look up the definition, you're going to find out it's a process of learning and the acquisition of knowledge. But the logical leap of the acquisition of knowledge is that you also are acquiring other things, beliefs and values. And so it is it is it is definitely a complete process involving the entire being. And the heart is a very important part of of it because it's your soul. It's your conscience. You know, Um, it's the idea of morality and manifesting out. In a later date, it's not something you can learn, memorize, and regurgitate back. It's this this time sensitive experience that happens over time where you develop this common sense and this consciousness. But it's all tied together, and I definitely think that education is not just rooted in the cognitive. It is is a whole body process, and the heart is as valuable as the mind. So, what I've noticed just in my own lifetime is, and I, I you know, growing up, I had a mixture of of Christian school and and public school. And, um, you know, as, as the culture became more and more secular, you know, you, and you still kind of hear this, people talk about this today. Well, you know, we got rid of prayer and we got rid of the 10 commandments and look what happened. And, you know, people debate is that Mm -hmm. causation or correlation or whatever. (laughs) But, um, but as I recall it from the public school perspective, for a long time, it was, we're not here to teach values. So we're getting rid of some of these things because it's not our job to teach the, the morality and values. Um, we're here to educate on these other things, and that's your job as parents to do the other part of it. Well, we've really, I think, come full circle on that. And the schools very much are, are teaching values and morality, but from a very secular point of view. And so um, I think part of that... I don't want to say it's a good thing because I don't like generally what they're doing with it, but at least they're being more honest with the fact that you, you can't separate these things. You can't just teach raw facts <coughs> that are divorced from, from values and morality. The, the two are just so intertwined. You can't, you can't separate them out um, that easily. And so, so really the point is we're all doing it. Um, we're all teaching values and morality, both in the way we live our lives um, and, and, and the way just we communicate to people, the question is, are, are we aware of what we're teaching? And are we, are we deliberately trying to align what we're, what we're teaching with you know, biblical values, biblical view of man, teaching to, to the heart and not just the head? And um, so I think, you know, we're, we're, like I said, we're, we're all kind of doing that. The question is, how, how well are we doing? How consciously and deliberately yeah. are we doing it? I remember um, <clears throat> I was at... Excuse me. I was at First Pres Augusta when the whole controversy about the Ten Commandments 
coming off the walls of courtrooms across the country. And mm-hmm. if you're a PCA person, you'll recognize this name. John Oliver was preaching at the time, and you know it, he incorporated it in one of his sermons. I'll, ne- I'll never forget him leaning over the pulpit and telling his congregation, you won't have to worry about the Ten Commandments coming off the walls of any building if you place them on the hearts of your children. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, mm-hmm. you know, that was something that stuck with me as a parent growing up, um, as a parent, you know, having, having kids, then watching them, you know, the, the idea of what we are doing in our household, what we are doing as a family has a lasting impact on students, um, on our students, even no matter what school they go to. Good. Um, next question. Are your children becoming biblically literate? And if not, what can your church and your family do to remedy that? Marty, so I think you, you kind of addressed that some with, with our church's approach to this already. Um, do you have any other thoughts on that? Well, so I think that our young people are more biblically literate than most. Um, and I think that's a product of sitting under the preaching of the Word. And the kids listen. That's another thing, you know, uh, preachers learn early on that those two-year-olds are listening because they'll come up and say things or you'll find in the pews little things they drew that were basically their depiction of something. It's like an Egyptian hieroglyph of some (laughs) epic um, mythology, but it's them drawing it, um, and they've been listening to you. Mm -hmm. So there are, um, you know, sitting under the preaching of the Word, being in classes where they were were well instructed. I think ours are are more knowledgeable than than most. Um, you know, we've said this before, but the minivan conversations. I think a lot of our families uh, do that. You know, as you you know, as um, as Deuteronomy says, you uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. So I think that uh, that we, we saw, my wife and I saw in our home, a lot of minivan conversations, dinner table conversations, where we were able to talk about things that um, we knew they needed to know or that they were learning in, in, uh, in church or in Bible studies. And uh, so, so I think more than most, I mean, do we all need to know more, of course, but I think that there, I think that our kids are more biblically literate than most would be. Yeah. I mean, I would agree. I mean, I think that's, you know, the one, one of the advantages of, you know, our kids being in a Christian school is that Bible has been a class that they have taken all the way along. And so they have a good survey of the, the old and new Testament. I mean, Aubrey's in college right now and she's has an old Testament class that she's loving because it's digging deeper than the survey she got, you know, in high school. Um, but I think that would be one of the benefits. And plus that splashes over to, like Marty said, to the, the minivan and the living room and the breakfast table and, you know, um, vacation where you get to have these conversations that might not come up because they're in dwell, they're in dwelling in it. You know, they're, they're deeply, um, thinking about it because it's part of their everyday life. So, um, I would agree that, you know, and that's what I have found at the the school where I am currently employed is that those students know their Bible and know their history according to their Bible. And I I attribute that to that's a class that they take and they have to, you know, they have to um, engage it, you know, where, you know, if you don't, then you've got to get it someplace else. And that might be a little bit harder for some. Yeah. Okay. Uh, We'll go to the next question here. Should should Christians... Pull their children out of public schools. Okay, here we go. List reasons for doing so and against it. Is the so they can be salt and light reason for leaving them in public school a rationale or a ration, rationalization? I think in parentheses there it says this is a pastor only question. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, no, we shouldn't take our kids out of public school. And, and uh, okay, some joking around a little bit. I would say no. Um, and a couple of things I really think we got to remember, and you and I were talking about this last night a little bit, is um, cr- private education or homeschooling is just not an option for some people. Mm-hmm. It is utterly not an option. They may not be suited for it personally. I'm thinking about homeschooling now. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I say suit, 
personally, it might be it might be their abilities just to educate well. It might be just emotionally suited for it. You know, some people, I have a daughter who works as a fourth grade teacher. She's great working with kids all day. Um, but there are going to be other parents that are not, mm-hmm. you know, and and that's um, so, so not everybody's suited for it. If you're talking about private education, that takes substantial resources that not every family has. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you're if you're a two in or if you're an intact family and say dad makes enough money to support everybody amply and even to pay for private ed and mom's good at uh, and she really is bent to be an educator, then probably all the options work for you. But, but I think we got to be honest. There are a lot of people, single, single parents, dual income homes where, again, they're not working. They're not both working because they want to have indulgent excess. They're both working to get by mm-hmm. at a reasonable level. So not everybody can just pull their kids out of public school. I, I think that's a um, that that's a naive thought, and and I think that's very simplistic. To, I know we're not saying that here, but I've heard it over the years. Mm-hmm. You know, people, well, you just need to do it and make it happen. Mm-hmm. And um, for us, as we transitioned to public school years ago, we knew there was going to be now. Well, when they were in private school, there were solid Christian families. There were some kids in private school that were a mess. Mm-hmm. So that was there. And we knew that when we transitioned them to public school, especially here in Greenville, South Carolina, they had a lot of Christian teachers. They had some teachers that were openly Christian in public classrooms. Even talking about evolution and critiquing the theory openly from a Christian point of view. So, so now that's Greenville, South Carolina. That's mm-hmm. not Seattle, Washington, or Boston, or whatever. But, but our um, and and we knew that then they would go to school. We would conserve the emotional energy mm-hmm. and physical energy, and then when they came home, we would interact with them about those things. So, some of the I think some of the advantages to it is it can actually strengthen their ability to deal with certain things down the road. I, uh, when, when I was young, I'll tell you how my dad taught me to swim. My dad, World War II veteran, you know, so didn't really think about how I was feeling about things a whole lot. Um, that conversation never got had. <laughs> and the way he taught me to swim is he would get in the pool with me, and that's when I was a little tiny kid, and he would, he would pull his knee up, and he would let me sit on his knee, and he would take me, and I wanted him to wade around in the pool with me because I liked being in the pool. And then he would just drop his leg out from under me, and and then he would step back, and I would be sputtering and call and trying to you know trying to get my head above water, and I'd be like you know Dad, get me, get me, and he'd be like swim, swim, you know, and and he would just do this, and and he like I have a year like a memory a year at the pool where it was just constant, you know, there went the knee, and you you know you went into the water. And, and I'm surprised you still want to go in the water. I ended up on swim team. So, you know, it was, uh, what happened is he would just tell me, swim, swim. And now he was there with me. So he, right. Dre, Dreher uses the analogy, you wouldn't throw your kid into a roaring river to save somebody else from drowning. You wouldn't throw your four-year-old into the mm-hmm. river. But my dad was in the river with me. Yeah. My dad was in the pool with me. He navigated me through those things. And, 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 they, and, and that's how I learned to swim and to be a good swimmer. And, uh, and then early on, and then, and then it went to following dad, you know, his dad went underwater and his dad swam in the pool, me trying to keep up with him, me following him, doing what he did. Mm -hmm. And then eventually walk into the pool by myself, you know, and, and going to the pool for the morning. So I think that that is an advantage if, uh, of, of a public setting as a family helps their kids learn how to navigate that so that then when they do start to encounter things that are, well, as they increasingly encounter non-Christian things, mm-hmm. they're, they're prepared for those things. I think the, um, the cons to public ed, and, which is largely secular ed, I would acknowledge are, I think, a lack of a cohesive worldview. So you've got to be, you've got to be working to tie things together yep. for your kids. And then sometimes even, and my kids have experienced this, overt opposition mm-hmm. because they're Christians. But but again, that happened in a context where they came home that day and we sat down and we talked about it mm-hmm. because Christians are going to encounter opposition. So we weren't tossing them out there at three years of age 
But by the time they had gotten to the end of high school, they had all very clearly learned what it meant to be a minority in a secular culture. So I'll, I'll uh, offer a bit of a different opinion. I mean, when we encounter parents in our uh, enrollment meetings, one of the things I say to them is, this is your decision. Not everybody's called to be in a Christian school. But I, I, I want you to understand that our goal as a school is to be the, one of the great options you have as a parent. But I agree, not everyone is called, but it is, it is the responsibility of each parent, each family, to discern what God is calling them to do and where God is calling them to place their children. Some are called to, to public school. I, I will openly acknowledge that. But um, the idea of private Christian education is not a calling that everybody feels. Um, but our school's idea is, and our school's responsibility is to be an absolutely great option for you when you consider that. Um, you know, the idea that um, there are a lot of barriers to private education, I think, is a problem. I think, you know, that one of the things he's promoting is that everybody needs to drop everything and go to either the, your local classical Christian school or start one. That's not a light switch conversation. That's just not something you throw on to, to light the room up. There, there's a lot of... of uh, a lot of foundation has got to be laid. There's lots of prayers. There's lots of uh, to start a school and to sustain that school. I mean, that's that's there's a lot there that he's you know talking about that has to take place down the road. Um, but I think his point is that, and I think it's Marty's point is that you have to understand what what your current system is and make sure you have the means necessary to deal with whatever comes your kid's way. I do I do not think. Like the option to um, to be a light in your secular school is something that you should consider for your kids. Just because I just remember when I was in high school, I wasn't really worried about um, being a testimony as, and I grew up Catholic. I mean, I wasn't worried about that. I was worried about fitting in. <laughs> I was worried about not getting beat up. I was worried about making the baseball team. I was worried about all these other things that make teenagers neurotic. And the last thing on my mind was, you know, being a good example of a moral person to the next guy, you know, that what, so I think you have to be realistic about where, what your kids, where your kids are, what they're going through at that point in time. But I think it, it becomes down to your individual family's decision bathed in prayer in conjunction with God. And I know God is the author of clarity and not confusion. And so, um, but I think making it a collective decision and a statement as a collective, um, you know, denomination or church is, not rooted in scripture because I think scripture makes it very clear. Okay. All right. Next question. How are some Christian schools more of a vac vaccination against taking faith seriously than an aid to doing so? And what role do parents play or fail to play in tandem with Christian schools in the formation of their children? I think it's a great way to, to couch this, you know? Yeah. So I mean, tell us what he means by that. Why, why, why does Craig get to answer this? <laughs> Please. <laughs> no, I mean, what he's talking about is a vaccination is, you know, a shot of a little bit of virus to get your immune system pumped up. And I think he's referencing the fact that there are some Christian schools that are Christian in name only. And they they um, basically present you everything you could have in a public school. But we're just going to put a Christian name around it and we're going to hire Christian teachers and have a Christian mission. But basically nothing much changes. You're still doing all the things public schools do. And um, that to me is, you know, I, I've encountered that, but not as it's not as widespread as people might think. So. Well, I'll, I'll say one example that I've seen of this um, <clears throat> that I think is what he's getting to here. We this is when we were living in a different city. I was, you know, shooting the breeze with some dads on the, the sideline of football practice one day for the, for one of my boys. And and um, these couple of dads were sending their kids to this. Um, very expensive uh, Episcopal school. And, but clearly the way that they talked about it, their, their motivation for doing that was 100% academic, 100% to get them into a great college. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all these dads cared about. And they said, this is so expensive, but you know, I'm going to, I keep doing it because they tell me 
um, that, you know, if, if they graduate from this school, they're definitely going to get this on the SAT. And that definitely means that I'm not going to have to pay for college or something like that. So it's kind of the rationale is I'm paying now so I don't have to pay later. And they didn't care at all about the faith based part of it. It was just that it was a lot better than what they would get in the public school. And I think that's probably a big part of what he's talking about here. All right. Um, last question. Is a classical Christian school a viable option for your family? What about homeschooling? And if neither is, what would have to happen to change that? Okay, so there's there's something he's very clearly kind of pushing towards, I think, just in, in the way he phrases the question itself. Well, I mean, he never really comes. I mean, why classical? I think that's worth exploring here a little bit. The idea of classical, to me, addresses the idea of how you want your kids to think from an intentional perspective. I think that's one of the things that he, why he's latching on to classical, because he's talking about, you know, secondary cultures. He's talking about parallel cultures and, you know, he's talking about worldview. He's talking about mindset. Well, where do you learn all that? And where is it done intentionally from a Christian perspective? Well, classical, you know, addresses things from the trivium. The trivium kind of is the way you, divide your schools, but it's also the way you teach your kids to think. You know, you start at the grammar level, memorizing and and uh, chanting, and then you move to the logic where you start to move from abstract or concrete to abstract. And then the rhetoric is where you start to apply things and discover new things. So I think his whole idea is our kids need to think from Christian constructs. And from a classical perspective, that's where it's intentional. I see that as part of the intentional approach of classical education is they think about thinking. They talk about thinking. They use taxonomies to, to teach your kids to think. And, and you just, those things happen naturally by default in other methodologies. But in the classical tradition, it's approached from an intentionality that I just don't think is elsewhere. You know, um, for our family, it was, it's always part of what we talked about is how you think, how you think and what defines your thinking and how you, we don't want you just to, to hear me talk and then regurgitate what I'm saying. I want you to filter it, you know, beat it around the bush, uh, com, you know, put some other ideas out on the table, which one competes, which one, you know, the, the idea of thinking in higher categories, I think is, is what he's after here. And that is addressed very intentionally in meth, in, in, from a methodological standpoint in the classical tradition. So the, what would it take to make that happen? It, it, it takes buy-in and resources. And really the buy-in is part of, well, it gives you participants and it gives you the resources to do it. So I'm thinking specifically about a school. Yeah. And coming back to classical, maybe it would help to touch on this, is the classical model um, also emphasizes three phases of learning. Right. When they're very young, there's the grammar, yeah. the memorization. Yeah. When uh, in those middle school years, they move into... Uh, argument and logic, which people have noted that that's what middle schoolers do anyway. Yeah, you know, so it's very natural. And then in the third phase, there's rhetoric or their ability to articulate and advocate and own those positions. So clearly, public education is not classical. And that was one of the things that Selene and I lamented when we transitioned from a private classical education to a public education. I think I said this earlier is interestingly in, in church, they were sort of classically educated mm -hmm. uh, catechism and Bible stories and Bible content on the young age, you know, when they were young, then understanding how to think through that and argue it and, uh, and then apply it as they got older. So, um, but, but if you're going to put together a classical Christian school, you have to have enough population and commitment yep. of people that are willing to do it and willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And you can do classical homeschooling, and there are co-ops that specialize in that. But again, that takes a certain commitment of resources and capability. So what does it take to make it happen? Um, you got to have, if you're going to have a school, you got to have enough people that are willing to participate and pay for it. And, um, and I would say, because obviously he wants to see people move in that direction and get something going if there's not something there. And again, we talk about callings. You know, some people, Craig's an educator. So if you dropped Craig in the middle of somewhere where there was no option like that, that would actually kind of get him going to get something started. He would kind of like doing that. And he's got the skill set to do it. 
Um, and, and so if you have people that can do that, but that wouldn't necessarily be, um, you may not have that, you may not have enough people to do that in every community. So, um, but demographics would be important. I mean, you could, you could drop that idea in the middle of one area and it wouldn't resonate with people. You, you, you like Marty said, you've got to have a collective group of people that want this are willing to pay for it and then sacrifice for it. There's a lot of sacrifice to, to get these schools moving and, and get them to the point of sustainability. Well, and in the schools and, and, you know, when our kids were in private classical Christian education, um, part of the sacrifice for a lot of families was if they were going to stay there, they were going to not have certain other things mm -hmm. that, you know, they weren't going to have a baseball team. They weren't going to have a football team, that, the things that their kids often were, were wanting to participate in. So again, I'm going to come back to that. I means you've either got to be willing to do without those things, yeah. or again, you got to have sufficient buy-in that you can have a classical Christian school that's also, especially in the upper grades, offering extracurriculars a lot of people are looking for. And I think we would all agree the extracurriculars are not a necessary part right. of education, but not the education itself. But, um, but yeah, it just takes, it takes commitment. And um, like Craig said, some communities, that's going to be easier to do than others. Okay. Well, good. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for helping us think through that this week. Um, Craig, I'll ask you to close sure. us in prayer, please. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the... Again, another morning you've provided for us. We thank you for this book, and uh, we thank you for how it is prompting and pushing our thinking. Um, we ask that you will watch over us today and continue to use this book and in conjunction with Scripture to draw us closer to you so we can be more like you. Uh, Father, we pray for churches and schools, families who are putting you first, Lord. Watch over them and protect them. And Father, as we go our separate ways this morning, protect us and return us uh, to talk about more things that will grow us in our faith. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.